Arjun is in a miserable position. That is not the position of Arjun, the person. That is the situation of entire mankind. That is the conflict that we all face daily, every day. So first of all, it is not about Arjun and Krishna. It is not about two persons. Arjun and Krishna are both within us. Krishna is not standing in front of Arjun. Krishna is the heart of Arjun. There exists only knowledge. There is nothing called absence of knowledge. Even when you say about a thing, I do not know, you are still just being humble and not accurate. With humility you are saying you do not know. But actually there is a lot that you already know in your own frame of reference. In your own assumptions you may say about that object. There is nothing in the entire universe about which you know nothing at all. Today, for example, you have one story about the eclipses, right? So the sun, the moon, the earth, they come in one straight line and so the view of the sun from the earth is obstructed because the moon is in between. Hmm? Because the moon is in between, so there appears some kind of a dark patch or circle or ring on the sun's surface. So you have this story, right? And this you call as knowledge. This is your knowledge of eclipses. What do you think? Was there ever a time when man said, I do not know what eclipses are. Was there ever a time? No. Today you have this story. A thousand years back, you had some other story. And a thousand years prior to that, you had some other story. So where is absence of knowledge? There never is absence of knowledge. There just is lower knowledge and higher knowledge and highest knowledge. What is lower knowledge? Based on beliefs, assumptions, such things. What is higher knowledge? Based on facts. What is highest knowledge? To know the known object and the knower together. Getting it? Ignorance has been defined here. Ignorance is illusory knowledge. Mind you, ignorance is not an absence of knowledge because we are never short of knowledge. Even the fellow you name as rank ignorant is very full of knowledge. Hmm? Very, very full of knowledge. Take an entirely new fruit to a people. Let's say you bring a fruit from Africa. It's native to Africa, not found in India at all. And you show it to Indians. What do you think? They'll say, we know nothing about the fruit. What are you going to hear from them? Okay, they'll, they, they'll be people who say, ah, this, this name. I know, I know. My grandmother used to be very fond of it. But it's slightly bitter. You better, you know, uh, cook it with caution. Somebody will say, this will go very well with potatoes. Is there anyone to say, I do not know? And as I said, if there is someone who does say, I do not know, that fellow is just displaying humility. Even he is not being accurate. Even he, in his depths, 
does know a lot about that fruit. There is nothing at all in the entire universe about which you know nothing. And all this is obviously stupid knowledge, false knowledge, assumed knowledge. Absolutely rare is the person, liberated is the person who will really know that he does not know. Hmm? A poet once said that if you were to know even a grain of sand, you will have to know the entire universe. So complicated is the matter of knowledge. So there is actually nobody who knows anything. But we all live in the belief that we know. It is for this reason that the great work Shiva Sutra opens with the declaration Jnanam Bandha Knowledge is bondage. You just think you know. In fact there can be no thoughts without knowledge, no ego without knowledge. So, the spiritual person will have to begin as a skeptic. He will have to be very doubtful, very unsure. His spirituality is not at all for people who are so sure, cocksure. And it is for very resilient people because we live by our beliefs which are just assumptions and when you enter spiritual inquiry then your beliefs are attacked ruthlessly. You should have the resilience to bear that attack. Otherwise you will simply either collapse or run away. You will say no but this is not what. Many people come to the scriptures or teachers just for self-validation. So as long as the teacher is saying something that they already agree with, hmm, they will keep chugging along. They will keep nodding in approval. But the moment the teacher starts doing his real work and starts disassembling them, hmm, they run away hurling abuses at the teacher. Hmm, they say the, he knows nothing. He is challenging even the basics. That's exactly what you do not want to be touched, challenged, looked into the basics of your life. Those basics are not solid, just hot air. Somehow you have come to believe in a few things and now you are continuously living by those things, taking them as real, they are not. Hmm? And it's a mark of utmost courage to let your central beliefs be touched, tested, hmm? to allow your internal structure to be dismantled, that's what requires the highest kind of courage. So, what is illusory knowledge? The example given here is like that of the snake in the rope. So, it's not that you are saying, I do not know what that longish cylindrical curvy thing is. You are not saying that, are you? Hmm? There is a 
rope lying in a dimly lit place. Are you saying I do not know what that thing really is? Hmm? It's pretty slender. That's all that I can say. Hmm? It's inactive, not moving. It's curvy. Do you say that? Very few people say that. Immediately, you come up with your versions of what that thing actually is. So, one of the versions has been taken here. Someone comes and says, that's a snake. That's a snake. That's the foolishness we live with. There's nothing wrong with not knowing what something is. But it is absolutely foolish to not know yet claim to others and pretend to yourself that you know. That's the mark of the stupid mind. Not knowing yet convincing itself that it knows. Hmm? The snake in the rope. So, just as you look at something and you take it to be something else. Similarly, ignorance or agyan is when you look at Brahm, you do not realize it as Brahm. You look at rope Brahm and you start thinking that it is the rope. No, no. Even taking a rope as rope is illusion. Taking a rope as snake is beyond illusion. It is stupidity. But even to take a rope as a rope is illusion. In spiritual terms, you are not in illusion only when you look at the rope and see Brahm. What does that mean? It's not as if you are looking at the rope and seeing something else there. And you start saying, I can see. If not Brahma, at least Brahma there. No, that's not what is to be done. You do that, that's a sign of mental illness. Eyes must look at a rope as it is. The mind has to be disciplined enough to see the entire process of perception of the rope. The mind has to be that active, that, that smart, that sharp. It has to happen in a split second. It has to happen without the passage of time. Look at the rope and that very instant, it strikes you. You realize. Realization is not a thought, right? You cannot realize something after it has happened. Realization is not something that happens after an interval of time. It has to be instantaneous. So you look at the thing and immediately as you look at the thing, you look at the looker also. You look at the entire process that is happening. And when you look at these two together that you could call as knowledge, realization or technically, more accurately, witnessing. Getting this? So, you have to go against your system because the eyes do not want to look at their own functioning. The mind wants to get absorbed in something outside of itself. You have to train the mind to do this tightrope walk. On one hand, look at the other, and in the same moment, look at yourself. You can lose track of neither the other nor yourself. Both these have to be balanced. You have to remember the inside and the outside simultaneously. Are you getting it? Hmm? When you do not see these two together, then you will always see things as different and diverse. Are you getting this? It's like this. If I want to put it in a mathematical equation. A 
i and o are variables and b is a constant i and o are highly variable and b is a constant now i plus o is b i plus o is b where i and o are variable they are dynamic variables they'll keep changing and b is a constant if you look only at i what will you find variability because i is variable if you look only at o what will you find variability but when you look at these two together what do you find constancy that constancy is brahm are you getting it so those who just keep looking at the external world they live in variables diversities changes differences something is going up something is coming down everything is separated from the other nothing is similar to the other those who just keep looking at their own thoughts hmm the so called solitary meditators they cut themselves off from the world and they are saying you know we are just going within going within within two what they will find only differences hmm clouds of thoughts and winds of feelings and so much happening inside there is an entire universe which is variable but if you look at these two together then you find something that is unchanging very constant that is brahm hmm also when you look only at the outside then you are rooted to the inside you cannot look at the world being nothing looking at the world implies acting as an incomplete self right as an incomplete self you keep ogling at the world so you are attached to the i when you are ogling at the o getting it equally when you are looking at your insides you are looking at the insides actually as someone who is a product of the outsides the outsides have raised you and the raised one who has come from a process of external conditioning is now trying to look at the self so he is actually welded to the outsides oh but when you look at these two together then your center is neither i nor o then your center is beyond these two then you are centerless in a sense you have been freed are you getting it it's a thing that one has to practice someone does something you want to talk of and focus on and think of what that fellow has done and that fellow has done something exciting exciting in the positive or the negative sense exciting because it makes you happy or exciting because it annoys you so when that fellow has done something and let's say that fellow is sitting right in front of you the entire focus of your mental energy is on that person right you totally forget what is happening to your mind in this instance right you have totally forgotten because what the other has done is very important what the other has done has has a certain importance so you start concentrating totally on the other the o and the i is forgotten now in this moment if you can see what the result of the excitation is on your own mind then your tendency to concentrate on the other 
and thereby cling to the other and thereby gain a center in the O will reduce. Are you getting it? You see something particularly exciting. If at that moment you can just take a U-turn and see what that exciting thing is doing to your system, you will find that the attractiveness of that thing will diminish. Hmm? Getting it? In some sense, you have you have you have, you have taken your first baby step from duality towards non-duality. Hmm? Two things we learnt about ignorance. One, ignorance never exists as absence of knowledge. Second, ignorance lies in looking only at one end of duality. And when you look at only one thing, then you will see a lot of diversity or bhed in the language of the scripture. Right? The reason why we look at one end of duality, that is again because of inertia. Uh -huh. Right. Well connected. Well connected. See, all these are techniques in some sense. If you can honestly remember what happened to you the last time you were so obsessed with that one worldly object. Hmm? As the scripture says, man or woman, um, the immobile or the mobile, hmm? animal or God, that object could be anything. Do you remember what happened the last time you were so attached to one of these objects? Do you remember? If you can remember that, right in the moment of the attack of attraction, you will be liberated. At least you will be saved in that moment. But we don't remember. It would be great had we had no memory at all. Man's memory is akin to his ego, which is akin to his consciousness. Existent, but incomplete. If we do not remember anything at all, we would at least be saved from the tyranny of the past. But we remember, and remember partially and selectively. Hmm? That is the reason why in the scriptures one of the things that is asked for is either total dissolution of memory or complete remembrance. Now complete remembrance of all the events is not possible because it is an infinite line. So when it comes to complete remembrance it is said you remember only the one. Implying that you forget everything. Either remember everything or forget everything. But please do not have selective, partial and distorted memory. We might be products of the past. But just as we do not know ourselves, we do not know the past. Think of it. We all say, I do not know myself. But where do you come from? the past. If you do not know yourself, that directly and clearly implies that you do not know the past. But when it comes to the past, we say, I know my past. My middle school I did from Jamshedpur. For my graduation, I went to Leeds. Hmm? Post-graduation from Sydney. Past you know so much. Had you really known your past so much, effectively you would have known yourself. But self-awareness you have zilch. About the past you claim so much knowledge. How is it possible? We have very little memory. It's an 
illusion of memory that keeps us going. We think we remember. It can be a very good exercise, spiritual exercise, to just test your memory. How would you test your memory? If you are the tester. So you need to have a group exercise. Hmm? Six or eight of you should be present in an event and experience it as a group. And then after a week, talk about it. And then you will realize that there were seven parallel events. How is it possible that all of you are trying to narrate the same thing, the same event or the same place, same happening? Not at all. I used to enjoy it a lot. When I would speak to my student audiences, hmm? having spoken to them, I would circulate a piece of paper for each of them, a separate piece of paper for each of them and ask them to write down. Write down what have I told you over the past two hours, hmm? point wise, 10, 15, 20, as many points as you want. And then I would collect the sheets and read them and have a good laugh and then circulate it back. I'll say, now these sheets can come back to you. Just ensure that you have your neighbor's sheet. Hmm? Your sheet has been swapped with that of your neighbor and read it. And very soon we would have these pairs fighting among themselves. Because what would be written by one would just not agree with what the other had written. And they had just attended the same session not even far back in history, right now. Still, their memories would disagree so much. Funniest part is, often a lot of them would have written something that I would not have mentioned at all. Memory is such a cheat, it not only deletes, it also overrides and superimposes. Hmm? So this girl would come and say, Sir, see, this boy has written all these things. You never said all these things. And I would say, you are right. At least to this extent you are right. I actually never said all these things. And the boy would be feeling very confident. He would say, no, you actually said these things. The saving grace was, we were carrying that little handicam. So there was some kind of a proof of what had been said and what not. Can you imagine the enormity of the distortion? We are not merely forgetting. We are also imagining and superimposing the imagination on the memory. This is so horrible. Hmm? Sir, the camera you are saying was able to listen to you factfully and those so-called listeners were implying their own subjectivities and filtering your factful statements accordingly. But the camera is camera and that subjectivity and the difference in those subjectivities is what makes us human. So 
are you suggesting that we all should become like cameras standardized mechanical with no subjectivity creativity see at the level of facts you should be very much like the camera right it's just that the camera having recorded everything faithfully will not be able to put any of the recorded material to any use you have to be like the camera and then you have to go beyond the camera but to go beyond the camera first of all you need to learn something from the camera absorb the facts as cleanly as honestly and as much without distortion or corruption as possible and then go beyond the camera the camera stops at the recording you don't have to stop you now have to look at what has been said and then apply that hmm? what the camera does is a very very primitive stage of shravan it is not even complete shravan it is a very primitive kind of listening but it is still an honest way of listening at least it does not distort right and that is one of the prerequisites of attentive listening you should not distort hmm one of my favorite statements used to be and there is a video by that title when did i say that maine aisa kab kaha hmm and the statement would be i have said only what i have said you can search by that title maine aisa kab kaha because students would come up with all kinds of invented stuff they would say you know sir the last time you came you were saying all these things with me when did i say that so to that extent you must emulate the camera right and then you have to go beyond the camera manan nididhyasan samadhi for the camera there is not even manan what's the possibility of samadhi the way we ordinarily listen is inferior to even the way of the camera are you getting it actually you have to be way above the camera but you are not even at par with the camera hmm don't forget that maxim facts are the door to truth the camera is very honest with the facts without the facts or with concocted kind of facts any possibility of truth is subverted mm <laughs>